Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Steve Shallot. I'm the Business Development Director for NJ Spotlight News, and I'm actually standing in for John Mooney at this very moment, who has uh, technical difficulties, or else he would be the MC of today's program. But um, we're, we're very happy to have a, a great panel lineup uh, moderated by Lilo Staten momentarily. Um, and we also have a keynote from First Lady Tammy Murphy, which we'll get to in just a moment. Um, firstly, wanted to just uh, give you a little bit of, of, of background on today's event, which is entitled um, Maternal Health and Family Planning in New Jersey. And uh, we have an ambitious agenda um, thematically, so we're, we're going to uh, try to move quickly and, and keep the conversation going. These roundtables are a, a vital part of the NJ Spotlight News' editorial franchise. It allows us to conduct what we like to call live journalism, where we have expert voices joined together in real time um, with a journalist. And the, uh, the idea is to, is to get a compounded great outcome by having the panelists interact with each other, which is something that is hard to replicate in other formats. So we're really pleased to be able to take this topic live with you today um, under these circumstances. So thank you very much for joining us. I'd um, like to say that if you want to submit questions, there is a Q&A window within the Vimeo interface. Um, we encourage you to use that. We also encourage you to use the chat function, both to, uh, to comment further and also to speak with each other if you would like. And we will have uh, one of our colleagues, Rachel Holland, will be moderating that as well and, uh, and curating questions to feed to Lilo. Um, the hashtag for this event is Maternal Reproductive Health NJ. That's hashtag maternal reproductive healthcare NJ. If you want to post on social media and tag at NJ Spotlight News. And um, well, ironically, I'm about to introduce myself to say a, a few words on behalf of our sponsor, and it's a pre recorded segment, as you shall soon see. Um, but in any case, the sponsorship support is what enables us to bring these events to you live free of charge. And uh, we're grateful for today's support. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to myself. And then after that, we are going to um, to bring the first lady on for her keynote. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thanks, John. I'm Steve Shallon, Business Development Director for NJ Spotlight News. And it's my pleasure and privilege to be the producer of today's event. As John mentioned, it would not be possible to bring these events to the public free of charge without the gracious support of our sponsors, whom we would like to acknowledge this afternoon. Firstly, New Jersey Healthcare Quality Institute. The Quality Institute brings providers, payers, patients, and decision makers together to advance healthcare safety, quality, and affordability. The Quality Institute is the only independent, nonpartisan advocate working in New Jersey to promote healthcare accountability and transparency. It counts as members more than 100 organizations, all of which are committed to improving the safety, quality, and affordability of healthcare for everyone in New Jersey. The Quality Institute's vision is deeply committed to improving access and outcomes for reproductive health services in New Jersey, including contraceptive care and perinatal care. In addition to the Quality Institute's work in addressing disparities in maternal mortality and ensuring access to quality prenatal care during COVID-19, they also lead the New Jersey Reproductive Health Access Project, funded by Arnold Ventures, which is focused on the provider education and policy changes to expand access to all forms of birth control. So thanks very much to the New Jersey Healthcare Quality Institute. We'd like also to thank the Nicholson Foundation. For 20 years, the Nicholson Foundation has focused on improving the health and well being of vulnerable populations in New Jersey. The Nicholson Foundation is proud to join with NJ Spotlight News and its roundtable participants to build greater awareness among policymakers and the public regarding strategies that build equity and improve the health of mothers and infants in our state. As the foundation is spending down to a close at the end of 2021, it's their hope that other foundations, nonprofits, and public-private coalitions across New Jersey will build on this work for years to come. An example of a current project that directly addresses the role of systemic racism in creating health disparities is the Nurture NJ campaign, an initiative of the Office of the First Lady of New Jersey in partnership with the Nicholson Foundation and other foundations. 
The campaign's aim is to make the state the safest place to have a baby and eliminate the shameful health outcome disparities between black and white mothers and their babies. The Nicholson Foundation appreciates that NJ Spotlight News is elevating these issues and looks forward to the opportunity to do so again when the Nurture NJ Strategic Plan is released in January 2021. Thanks also to Planned Parenthood Action Fund of New Jersey. The Planned Parenthood Action Fund of New Jersey advocates on behalf of the tens of thousands of New Jerseyans who turn to a Planned Parenthood Health Center for Care each year. Across the state, Planned Parenthood's 22 health centers provide high-quality, affordable, essential reproductive health care services, including life-saving cancer screenings, birth control, testing and treatment for sexually transmitted infections and HIV, and safe legal abortion care. The Planned Parenthood Action Fund of New Jersey supports the belief that access to health care should not depend on zip code, income, insurance status, or immigration status. Over the last several years, its supporters and activists across the state have advocated for key pieces of legislation to help protect and expand access to reproductive health care, including the recently introduced Reproductive Freedom Act, which will help New Jersey to continue to lead on these issues. And more can be found at their website, www.ppactionnj.org. And lastly, we'd like to thank Thrive New Jersey. Thrive New Jersey is a statewide coalition of organizations working collectively to promote sexual and reproductive health, rights, and justice through policy change and advocacy. Their purpose is to bring together organizations to leverage collective voices and resources towards expanding access to reproductive and sexual health care in New Jersey, especially for communities that have been historically marginalized. Thrive NJ advocates for policy changes to ensure that all people who can become pregnant, regardless of their circumstance, have control over their reproductive health decisions and by extension their economic status by removing unnecessary or outdated barriers to health care and providing adequate resources to advance racial equity. So thanks to Thrive NJ. And thanks to all of our sponsors for their support today. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to John Mooney to help bring us into the beginning of our program. Thanks very much. John? Okay. I'd like to introduce Lilo Staten in the panel. Thank you for hearing those words. They're important and um, the, the cause is united as you've heard and we're very pleased to get to um, introduce the First Lady of the State of New Jersey, Tammy Murphy. Hello everyone, this is First Lady Tammy Murphy. I wanna thank the very reputable NJ Spotlight News for hosting this incredibly important roundtable, as well as for their invitation to be a part of today's program. Hats off to Lilo for her diligent coverage of healthcare issues across our state as well. Since we first began working to correct New Jersey's infant and maternal health crisis, I have been extremely heartened by and grateful for the support we've received. There's no one for whom this issue isn't deeply personal, and for those of us who have had the privilege of becoming mothers, it is even more so. The grim reality in New Jersey is that too many babies lose their mothers before they are even able to remember them. But we are here today to join together to change this reality. When I began looking into the maternal and infant health crisis, I naively believed that the problem could be solved just by increasing access to prenatal care. But as my great team and I dug deeper, brought in government agency after government agency until 18 agencies were involved, traveled the state and spoke to hospital systems, providers, foundations, advocates, and most importantly, mothers, the real experts, we began to realize how much more complicated and entangled this problem truly is. So we implemented short and medium term policy initiatives to immediately get our state on track. Through our initiative, Nurture NJ, we had family festivals in six of our urban centers. This means that instead of waiting for families to reach out to us for help, we brought our resources directly to them. In Patterson, Trenton, Camden, Newark, Atlantic City, and Jersey City, we gathered together state county and local resources, and with the help of nearly 600 providers, we served over 5,550 New Jersey families. We have also sought to combat this crisis legislatively. 
Phil, in partnership with the legislature, has signed 32 pieces of legislation relating to maternal and infant health, including ending Medicaid reimbursement for early elective cesarean sections and providing Medicaid coverage for doula care. We have received millions of dollars in federal funding to support our Maternal Care Quality Collaborative. The collaborative will make us a national leader in collecting, identifying, analyzing, and reviewing data on maternal mortality and morbidity. But in addition to all of these initiatives, facing this complex problem also requires acknowledging the very dangerous role that implicit bias and systemic racism play in the delivery of medical care. A black mother in New Jersey is seven times more likely than a white mother to die from maternity related complications. And a black baby is three times more likely than a white baby to die before his or her first birthday. The danger comes not only from the outcomes, but also from its almost complete invisibility. It is called implicit because we ourselves are not aware that we hold these biases, no matter how well-meaning we are. And without training, our doctors, nurses, and medical staff are left unable to identify their own. When we look at our state's maternal and infant mortality rates, the result of this is anything but invisible. I don't need to remind you that this is 2020 and we should not be losing any mothers or any babies. So even as we respond to the COVID-19 crisis and we plan our recovery, we must continue our fight for equity in healthcare. To this end, I was both relieved and proud when Phil signed the revised budget, which included funding for implicit bias and anti-racism training in all 49 labor and delivery hospitals, as well as all FQHCs, and made a $1 million investment to increase the Medicaid reimbursement rate for midwifery care for the first time in decades. All of these pieces are important parts of our strategy to solve New Jersey's maternal health crisis, but they are not enough. This issue requires a long-term solution. For this reason, on Maternal Health Awareness Day this year, I was thrilled to introduce our team of multidisciplinary experts who are working to develop a science-based, comprehensive, and actionable statewide plan to not only reduce our maternal mortality rate by 50%, but also to eliminate the inequities that have led us to this crisis. Over the past year, our team of consultants has interviewed 18 state departments and agencies and had meaningful conversations across the entire state with stakeholders ranging from doulas to advocates to academics to healthcare providers and more. And perhaps most importantly, we held eight dialogue groups to speak with mothers across New Jersey, those for whom our initiative is the most personal. We are excited for this plan to be completed and unveiled in early 2021. I also want to add on the subject of reproductive health that a few weeks ago, Phil announced his support for the Reproductive Freedom Act. This act explicitly ensures all New Jerseyans have the right to make their own personal health decisions when it comes to birth control and pregnancy related care. These issues are all interrelated because the truth is that they are not matters of morality. They are matters of health resources and personal autonomy. And as Phil said several times that day, your body belongs to you. All of these initiatives are symbols of our unyielding commitment to the women and families of this state and to a stronger and fairer New Jersey for everyone. There is no denying that money is tight this year and the need for support has grown exponentially. But even as we address the new and changing obstacles of COVID-19, we cannot forget the maternal and infant health crisis that plagued our state, especially our black mothers and babies, well before the pandemic even began. I wanna thank NJ Spotlight News again for holding this important roundtable and all of you for joining us today. From raising awareness of this issue to discussing reproductive health policies and the practical dimensions of delivering equitable maternal care, our conversation today is another step towards solving this crisis. We owe it to every New Jersey family to treat this crisis as if every mother we lose is our mother and every baby we lose is our baby. And together, we will make New Jersey the safest and most equitable place in the nation to deliver and raise a child. Thank you. Thanks to the First Lady.
And with that, Leola Staten and our esteemed guests. Thank you. Hi, Steve. Um, and thank you to the First Lady and her team. Um, that was a, a lovely beginning and I'm flattered by the introduction. Um, it's always nice to have a shout out from the, from the front office there, um, the team in the front. Um, I, I think, you know, there's something, there's a lot of things that um, have struck in the development of this um, event. We've talked a lot about what it, what it means. Um, and it really caused me to sort of go back and look at reproductive health and what that is about. Um, and so I want to just make clear from the, from the beginning that this is going to be a panel about reproductive health. It's not going to be about abortion. It's not going to necessarily be about politics. Um, we're going to talk about the health impacts of these things. And I was struck in doing some of the research that, you know, some of the, um, the Senator Weinberg, for example, when she was talking about the Reproductive Health Act, talked about our bodies ourselves. And, you know, which was sort of the theme for the original, what became the women's movement in a lot of sense, but it grew out of health, right? It, there's a health a foundation in health. Um, and I think that's important. Um, and Senator Weinberg said in, in the event that was the kickoff for this legislation that reproductive health is health care for all the families in our state. And I think that's kind of the way we're going to explore this today. Um, you know, from sex, from sex ed to contraception um, to pregnancy and beyond birth. Um, and we've heard a lot about some of the shocking uh, maternal mortality statistics, particularly the, the uh, disparities when it comes to Black women and in particular, and the racism that is involved in that, um, in impacting those those outcomes. Um, but we're also going to talk today about sort of on the other end of the spectrum. What about teen pregnancy? What about um, access to contraception and some of those things? Um, so to introduce my guests, uh, Leslie Cantor, professor and ch chair of the Department of Urban Global Public Health, director of several at Rutgers University. Um, and who had several programs there, including the Maternal Child Health Program at the Public Health School. Brittany Lee, um, a social worker with the New Jersey Healthcare Quality Institute, who leads the New Jersey Reproductive Health Access Project. And Linda Sloan Locke, a midwife, social worker, and more, a board member of the New Jersey of the Quality Institute, also on the steering committee of the New Jersey Perina Perinatal Quality Collaborative and more. Um, Linda, I'd like to come to you first. Um, give us a sort of sense of where we are now in New Jersey on that sort of big spectrum that I tried to introduce at the beginning to set this up. Um, where do you see, we hear a lot about maternal, maternal issues, maternal mortality in particular, but where do you see us on sort of the, the reproductive health as, aspects and some of the other places? And while we're at it, how is COVID impacting that? Okay, thank, thank you so much, Lilo. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much, Lilo. Thank you for having me today. Um, so I think one of the things that we are doing, I think in New Jersey, and I've been working as a midwife in New Jersey for over 40 years. So I have kind of a long-term picture of where we've been and where we are now. Um, I think one of the, the most encouraging things that I see is that we are now addressing the systemic issues you know, we've talked a lot about social determinants of health and how, you know, the social determinants of health are those things that, you know, where we live, where we are born, where we grow up, where we're educated. But I don't, I think what's been missing up until recently is looking at the structural determinants of health. Those are the, the big picture um, items, you know, those upstream policies and systems and practices like uh, racism, ableism, sexism, those things that impact and, and have an effect, those social determinants and how determinants play out for people in our state. So I think one of the things that is, is hopeful right now, you know, that I can take this long-term approach is, is beginning to understand, you know, that it is our systems issues that we need to, to work on. And those big picture things that, you know, we really haven't addressed in the past, we've been focusing and there have been a lot of good initiatives focusing on uh, supporting women and supporting families and addressing those uh, social determinants of health so that people have a better uh, outlook, right, a better, better chance of having better outcomes. 
but until we began to address the the more the broader structural determinants of health which we're beginning to do now you know those those areas we couldn't make sustained efforts we couldn't have sustained improvement in those, in those spaces um, so of course covid did identify i think and brought into stark reality uh, a lot of the disparities that i think we in maternal health were very aware of but i don't know that the public in general was aware of all of the disparities and how great they were and not just in maternal health but in a wide variety of health outcomes and all those outcomes intersect right it's a it's a system a system with intersectionality we all hold different identities and and so there are uh, multiple ways that that happens for instance when we talk about social determinants of health um, because during COVID there was so much of a shift to telemedicine and telehealth, um, American uh, APHA identified access to broadband as a new social determinant of health. So we began to see how all these things intersected. And I think um, even though COVID has, it has been a, a very big challenge, it has also served as a wake up call for that these are things that we must address in every single area of healthcare and how all of these things intersect and they all impact reproductive health care. Leslie, I see you nodding there. What what are you seeing in some of your numbers and what your what your research shows? Thing. Thanks to New Jersey Spotlight for having this terrific panel, and it really is an honor to be with all of you. I couldn't agree with Linda more that the important thing is for us to get to systems and structures and not just have this be about individual behavior change. I mean, I think what's interesting if you think about maternal mortality is that you have this intersection of racism and sexism that is leading to this terrible outcome. You know, I think the other thing that we can be doing more of is talking about sexual and reproductive health across the lifespan. And one mistake that's often made on these issues is we almost separate women who are trying to prevent pregnancy from women who get pregnant and give birth. And the truth is, it's just women at different points in our lives. So I have spent a lot of my career on issues like sex education, making sure that we can set young people up for a lifetime of success. And interestingly, while I think there is a ton to compliment New Jersey for, it was actually the first state in the country to have a mandate for sex education. Very interesting, in the most recent youth risk behavior survey, we actually had the lowest percentage of teens using any birth control method other than condoms. 50th, we are dead last, lower than Alabama. So we know that there are places where we can improve, uh, not only in terms of our sort of labor and delivery outcomes, but all the way through the life course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Campbell, I'm thinking, um, I mean, we, we hear about the, you know, the disparities in birth outcomes and maternal issues, and then also, you know, the, the, there's sort of the COVID racial and ethnic disparities overlaid on top of that. How have you seen these two things sort of come together, these two streams in the women that you're caring for? I mean, and, are, and, and what has that traffic been like during the pandemic? I mean, are you still, are women still coming forward for care? What, what are you hearing and seeing? Oh, um, so obstetrics is one of the few fields where you have to lay hands on the patient <laughs> to take care of her. So, um, you know, we, um, when the pandemic started and folks had stay at home orders, um, like many other services, we uh, did utilize the telehealth um, platforms, um, but we were still open for business. We were still seeing patients mm -hmm. every day because um, the way we assess women, um, we need, we're a lot of obstetrical care is preventative. So we need to check blood pressures. We're monitoring weights. Mm -hmm. um, 
So there's lots of things that is really hands-on. Um, but what we saw on the field, on the ground, was that you know women were fearful. Um, they didn't see um, if they felt fine, you know, and there was a stay-at-home order, only come out if it's medically necessary, or you know. So if they were feeling fine, they didn't necessarily see that preventative care in pregnancy as medically necessary. Um, so there was, and there was just a lot of fear about coming out. Um, and then additionally, you know, as we talk about the social determinants of health, uh, you know, folks are on the front lines. A lot of the patients that I work with, airport workers, um, working in nursing homes, um, working at, you know, in the grocery stores and fast food restaurants and transportation industries, they still had to go to work. And sometimes um, partners were laid off and then um, those women became the sole bread women winners for the house. So it was it wasn't possible to stop working and they had to prioritize uh, you know being able to provide for the family and coming to an appointment where maybe they felt fine. So I think those were some of the issues that we dealt with. And then certainly, of course, as we did try to do some things, um, on telehealth, we certainly did encounter patients that did not have uh, the equipment, um, the Wi-Fi service, the minutes and things like that uh, to be able to support telehealth. Right, just because it's available doesn't mean that works for everybody. I mean, it's this great feature for those of us that you know have internet connection and look at those of us internet that doesn't always work that well. So, um, Brittany, um, I'd like to come to you. Um, tell us where. Tell us about the you, the access to contra contraception aspect of this you know, spectrum, but also how does abortion fit into this? I feel like abortion tends to take up so much space in this discussion. And yet I, I meant to ask how big of a, you know, how big of a deal is that when we come to numbers overall? You know, when we're talking in the spectrum of as providers, that's a small slice of the pie, right? Sure, and, and thank you, Lilo and NJ Spotlight for having me on this panel. Uh, I'll answer your, your first question, or your second question first, rather. I think when talking about abortion care in New Jersey, it's important to remember that the full spectrum of reproductive health services are just that, it's health care. Um, so I'm not necessarily looking at it as this moral, political issue, but how are we providing individuals in New Jersey with the health care that they need in a really high quality and accessible way? Um, I think you're right that we can kind of um, have a larger conversation about abortion care because it's something that's really politicized and something that's in the news a lot. But if we center the conversation on the full spectrum of reproductive health care, we're going to end up with a much more holistic solution to our problems that we're thinking about preventing unplanned pregnancies, supporting mm -hmm. individuals throughout their pregnancy, um, and really at the end of the day, making sure that we're supporting an individual's reproductive autonomy, that that's the end goal in this. It's not pushing a form of contraception on anyone. It's not pushing the use of contraception on anyone. It's making sure that an individual can work with their healthcare provider to access a form of birth control that they would like if they choose to do so. And that like any other healthcare service, they should be able to do that without any infringement on their rights. So this is a conversation between the individual and their healthcare provider. The second part of your question that I want to touch on is, the barriers to birth control in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. I think, um, Leo, you mentioned it and the first lady mentioned it as well, that we talk about the word access a lot. And what does that really mean, right? If an individual has insurance coverage for some contraceptive care, um, if they can maybe find a provider that can see them, you know, just at 10 a.m. on a weekday when they have work and childcare and transportation to figure out, is that true access to the full spectrum of contraceptive services and reproductive health care? In New Jersey, over 435, I, I say women because that's the, the data source that um, Power to the Side, where the statistic comes from, uses, but 400, 435,000 women in New Jersey live in what's called contraceptive deserts, which is where they live in a county that they can't access the full spectrum of contraceptive care, meaning not all providers in the state offer every form of birth control. And that's not even getting into the issue of can I afford it? Can I get to the pharmacy to refill it? I just can't find a provider or a healthcare system that can offer all forms of healthcare services. 
Um, so I think in New Jersey, we have an amazing healthcare system and administration that's very supportive of family planning services and wonderful advocates and providers that we really can get to a place where everyone in New Jersey should be able to access you know, the full spectrum of reproductive health care. We're not there yet, but there's a lot of steps that we can take to get there. Yeah, I, I was I was struck by also in the Reproductive Health Act, and we can talk about this, you know, at any point, but um, it, how the focus isn't just about the access, but it's also about that those nuts and bolts of making sure you can pay for it, right? I mean, and, and it, you know, even if, if your insurance covers it, what is the copay? What is the, you know, is there an out-of-pocket cost? Because as I know from, from covering, you know, Medicaid copays or, or Medicare, or Medicaid copays, Medicaid, even a few dollars can be too much, you know? I mean, there are, there are real issues there um, for a lot of people when you're talking about marginalized individuals. Um, what do you think, Linda, I'd like to go back to you because I know you were cheering when the first lady talked about the, um, the, the raise in the rates for midwifery. Um, let's talk about some of these, you know, we, we share, there's a, you know, fairly long list of, of statutory changes and regulatory changes that have been put into place in a fairly short amount of time, um, you know, thanks largely to the first lady, and I would say Senator Weinberg's and Assemblywoman um, Veneri Huddle and others. Um, it's certainly not anybody alone, but there's a lot of leadership from the state officials. Um, tell us about Linda. I'd like to start with you. What are some of those? Where what's really moving the needle there? What are you seeing? Uh, thanks again. So uh, yes, yeah, very happy to hear about the the increase in reimbursement for midwives. Uh, New Jersey had the dubious honor of having the lowest reimbursement rate for midwives prior to this in the nation. So it was something that was uh, long overdue. Um, I think that some of the things that have been instituted um, are are really helpful. Uh, the first lady touched on not paying for early elective deliveries. We're also moving the needle on try, trying to um, talk about, so I wanna talk about one thing that, that is in the legislature but hasn't quite gotten to, you know, right. gotten okay. yet and gotten signed yet. Um, and because I think it's one of the things that's gonna have the biggest impact on the most people and that is extension of Medicaid past 60 days past uh, a birth. Right now it's mm. 60 weeks. You are covered by Medicaid, which is, you know, we know that Medicaid is the largest single payer for uh, people giving birth in our state. Um, so that's why we talk about it a lot, right? And um, the typical coverage ends for 60 days after the, the birth. And we know, and, and Dr. Campbell can really talk about this in depth because she has is a leader in the Maternal uh, Mortality Review Committee that we have here in New mm -hmm. Jersey. Um, but we know that much of our maternal mortality, some of it takes place prenatally, some during the birth, but a good segment of that is postpartum, and much of it is after that 60 days. So I think that extending that Medicaid coverage for the, a full year after a person gives birth is one of the most essential and important things we can do to really have a sustained, uh, sustainable impact on the, the problems that we see with maternal mortality and morbidity um, in our state. And we're making strides in that. Nationally, the House just passed this month, the House of Representatives just passed this month legislation to make it easier, the MOM Act, make it easier for states to do this, right? Not to go through a waiver uh, procedure so that if that then passes is the sentence and we know our two senators from New Jersey are supporting it so that's a good thing one is a co-sponsor so that's a good thing so we have our fingers crossed that that will pass that will make it easier for us to then go on in New Jersey and do that so that's one of the things that I think we can do in addition to some of the steps that we have taken that, that the first lady identified right Dom, Domily, Dr. Campbell do you want to add to that yeah yeah, actually, I just wanted to connect the dots a little bit uh, with what Brittany talked about with reproductive um, health and this connection in care. Because if you think about it, in the middle of a pandemic, uh, you know, women were being sent home from the hospital, 
um, a day or two after, and then, you know, don't come outside, <laughs> stay at home. And so how can they get their contraceptive needs addressed? And so the fact that part of the legislation uh, was trying to address um, payment for contraceptives to be given in the hospital, um, particularly for LARC to be available in the hospitals uh, is very important because we know that a third of women are not able to come back uh, for their postpartum visits. And certainly we saw an increase in those numbers um, at the um, height of the pandemic. So uh, if we can provide women with their contraceptive of choice before they leave the hospital, that's very helpful. And then as Linda spoke about having that expansion of coverage, because many women who um, may have chronic medical issues, diabetes, hypertension, if they can't get ongoing medical care, um, then it's difficult for them to be in their best medical state prior to another pregnancy. Then we're not giving them contraception that they need, and then they get pregnant again. And then we're saying, well, why did you get pregnant again when you weren't in your best medical condition? So this importance cannot be overstated um, in having that access uh, to providers to get the interpregnancy uh, care uh, for women um, that women need. It's it's remarkable as I hear you say this because it just it it makes me think that you you we we basically have created a system where women or individuals I should say who need um, reproductive care. It, it, they really are jumping through a series of hoops, right? Um, and Brittany, I want to I want to go back to you because um, I'm thinking about what you said earlier about what is access, right? Um, and I was also struck by this this comment made by um, uh, a director at the Cherry Hill Women's Center. I think it was at the same kickoff event for the legislation, but they talk about. She said, "A right is not a right when pe people cannot reach care in their own communities." Um, I've actually been looking at some some of the the states planning for vaccines. It's a totally vaccine distribution around COVID, totally different issue. But they did a lot of mapping, right, of of healthcare source resources. You look in some of these communities. I mean, Warren County, um, you know, Salem County. It's really you have to travel a long way to get to a drugstore, right? I mean, Brittany, tell us a little bit about what that means for, for women on the, and, and, and again, where have we moved the needle a little bit here? Sure. So um, I think thinking, using the example of getting to a pharmacy is a great place to start when talking about access. Um, and, in, you know, off the top of your head, you might think, oh, you know, if I have to go to my pharmacy once a month to pick up my prescription, that's not a big deal. But add on working multiple shift jobs, having children to take care of, needing public transportation, overall fear and distrust of the healthcare system and what that means when you're going to a pharmacist each time. And going to the pharmacy once a month becomes a much bigger endeavor than someone would think of. You know, coupled with the fact that for some forms of, of medication, um, people are automatically getting three months at a time, six months at a time, because sure health insurers and pharmacists know that when you have to go to the pharmacy less, compliance for a medication typically increases. Um, so looking at oral contraceptives, for example, the current policy in New Jersey is that an individual has to, if they're getting an initial script for an oral contraceptive, go to their provider, get a three month script, come back, you know, have a conversation with the provider to see how that's going. And then they have to return to get another script to their provider every six months. This could be mm -hmm. for an oral contraceptive, a birth control pill that someone has been on for five years. And every six months, they need a new script. Um, and I think what's important to consider is, you know, what are the experts? What are the professional organizations recommending? And the vast majority of professional organizations, including the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecology, um, says that giving individuals a full year of their contraceptive method of choice is the best practice. So that is what medical professionals are recommending, but that's not the current policy in New Jersey. Um, Part of the Reproductive Freedom Act recommends increasing that um, that uh, prescribing amount to 12 months, which is something that you know is a simple change that would drastically improve access to contraception 
for all individuals in New Jersey. Um, and that includes, you know, regardless of where you are in the state. So those folks that are having a really hard time getting to their provider office, it's made much easier for them. So making these small tweaks and access are really going to make a meaningful impact for individuals. Right. right. And they're, yeah, it, it does seem they're small on a lot of levels. Leslie, I'd like to ask you, um, what are we, we talked to you a little bit the other day on our planning call about um, what we're measuring and, and how we know what's working, right? Um, how, how are we doing um, and how do we know how we're doing based on what we're measuring and what we're seeing so far? And, and what do we need to measure that we're not, perhaps? Sure. This is, you know, the right question for the public health professor, right? Because we care a lot about data <laughs> and measurement. Um, you know, one thing that's overall very important in the maternal health space is that while there's been a lot of focus on deaths, maternal mortality, there's such a small number that it's very hard to see patterns. And so moving towards really looking at severe maternal morbidity, what's sometimes called near misses, may mm -hmm. actually be able to show us more. And now I'm glad the state of New Jersey is actually doing that at the state level. And I'm very proud to be part of an effort in Newark being coordinated by the Greater Newark Healthcare Coalition to look at uh, whether we can create some surveillance mechanism for really looking at severe maternal morbidity. So that is a key piece. Another really important piece in New Jersey is in general, making sure we're routinely looking at all of our data by race ethnicity. Because of course, shining a light isn't enough. But one of the reasons that we've actually put some resource and attention and energy to maternal mortality is because of the outrageous disparity. I mean, I look at public health data all the time. You're used to seeing some disparities, one and a half times, right. two times. As the first lady said, we've got a maternal death rate seven times higher for black women, but it's not the only thing for which we have disparities in the state. I've taken a look at the uh, top 10 causes of mortality for by municipality, and you mm -hmm. can see it in our key urban areas around things like heart disease and stroke and cancer. So we need to be doing that routinely so that we put our resources where they need to go. And I guess the only thing I just want to throw into the conversation is, you know, I think um, our panelists are really doing a nice job of like calling out where the rubber meets the road, right? That it's like, if all of these kinds of policies, how long do we cover people for, you know, how do people get to their birth control? But I feel like in the, today, the day after Amy Barrett was confirmed, to not say that the framework in this country right now for making sure that a ton of women's preventive services are covered is the Affordable Care Act. And we now have a Supreme Court that is likely very hostile to that. So while I am hopeful that insurers, because bottom line, they care about money and most preventive services save them money, so I am hopeful that for things like birth control, where we have reams of data that spending money on birth control saves money overall um, and cancer screening and everything else, I just feel like to not acknowledge, I love the idea that we can try to be in our New Jersey bubble, but uh, right. unfortunately we will be affected uh, by policy changes in the rest of the country if something doesn't happen to turn them around, which, you know, could happen. Yeah, I I hear this from so many different public health professionals, and it, it seems like we've moved past the debate on, so, I mean, we can debate whether the ACA is working and how it's working and whether it's saved money, you know, and whether you could keep your doctor and how bad the website was at first. I'll talk about that forever, but it seems like everybody agrees taking it away now would be a really bad move, you know, is that that would be really regressive steps. I mean, I, I don't hear a lot of arguments to the contrary, although I'm sure I will hear from them now, hear, hear some of those now. But um, Linda, before, I wanna, I wanna come to you and ask a little bit, what else do you think is missing, um, you know, on the state level or local level? What else do we need to do um, 
to sort of improve services to women or, or to individuals, reproductive health services across that spectrum? Um, well, I think the um, all of the speakers have, have highlighted how looking at reproductive health care and the full spectrum of reproductive health care as health care, right? We talk about access to birth control. In every other medication, you give several months at a time. You go, you get 90 days. That's, that's, that's it. That's the standard. Why do we carve out reproductive health care and treat it differently? So I think, you know, as we as we move towards making a lot of in the state, the, the closer we get uh, keeping reproductive health care as and framing it in this health perspective is one of the most important things that we can do. We are doing some things that I think are really good in, in addressing issues within our birthing hospitals. Um, the Perinatal Quality Collaborative, which is a CDC funded uh, initiative, we're in our, we're just going into our form. This is something we're a part of many such collaboratives in many states around the country. And the focus of that has been to, um, again, look at systems issues in hospitals and make sure that hospitals are focusing on evidence-based care um, and uh, put the particular things that we're focused on are reducing cesarean section rates. As a midwife, of course, I'm a champion of physiologic birth. I'm very happy about that because we know increased surgery can very often lead, to, if it's not truly indicated, can lead to increased uh, complications. And also we're reducing severe complications. Um, as was pointed out, m severe morbidity occurs 10 times more than mortality, right? We're, we're looking at numbers nationally of 50,000 birthing people a year compared to 700 people a year. So the numbers are huge. And so we, we often pay enough attention to those things. So the two uh, program projects that the collaborative is working on are AIM, national AIM programs, which is uh, looking at reduce not only mortality, but severe morbidity for hemorrhage and high blood pressure. So those are some of the things that we're already doing that we need to continue to do and ramp up. Um, of course, with COVID, some of the focus on some of these things you know, kind of got pushed to the back burner. And so we really need to be um, sure that we now continue to move, try to move the needle in those areas so that we can see some sustained improvement. Um, some other things that we can do, we're um, finally moving back into a little bit of birth and birth centers. But uh, like for midwifery, the, the last time anyone looked at increasing the rate for uh, birth centers to be reimbursed was in 1998. So uh, right now, birth center birth is not accessible for, for men covered by Medicaid because it's just the reimbursement rate is just enough for birth centers to be able to uh, be able to take patients on Medicaid. So that means that these women don't have access to the, uh, beyond that word access to the full scope of care. So those are just a couple of thoughts. And uh, Brittany, I want to come to you. I, I know you have something you wanted to add, but it, I, as I remember last, I think it was the Quality Institute report from a couple of years ago that I think 40% of the births in the state are, are covered through Medicaid. Is, is maybe, Brittany, you can correct me and, and follow up as you like. Sure. So, I mean, that statistic sounds right to me. I don't have it at the top of my hand, but Sorry. I think um, I didn't put you on the <laughs> no, no problem. Uh, Medicaid does uh, does cover a lot of births in the state, and yeah. um, for both individuals on Medicaid um, or not, I think it's important when we're talking about you know what we want to do to improve you know access to contraceptive care and reproductive health services that we need to not just think about these bigger policy changes that can happen, but what are the smaller changes in terms of providers and healthcare systems, right? That these are things that can be done really easily um, and we need to support our healthcare providers and our healthcare systems so that they can provide this care to their patients. In the work that we're doing at the Quality Institute around reproductive health access, we started our work around provider education because we knew that consumer empowerment and consumer education that is incredibly important as well as these bigger policy change initiatives 
wouldn't be successful if we were driving individuals into a healthcare system and into providers that weren't getting the financial support to provide the full spectrum of reproductive health care. They didn't know if they were going to get reimbursed for purchasing, for example, IUDs out of pocket and keeping them in stock for patients so that they wouldn't have to come back for more than one visit. Um, if they didn't have the education around cultural competency, shared decision making, reproductive justice. Um, so by supporting these healthcare providers to help them implement best practices and sometimes holding them accountable through quality measures and things like that, we can really, you know, in a much quicker way than we might see in some of these bigger policy changes, see the impact and see that trickle down to patients that uh, we don't always have to start all the way at the top. We can start somewhere in the middle and that might help us be more successful. Right. Uh, Dr. Campbell, I'd like to come to you, but I'm thinking that that is a role that the Quality Institute ends up playing a lot is where you're sort of this this liaison between the regulatory world and the input in the, you know, the provider world, because it seems to me that a lot of cases providers want to do the right thing. I and mean, of course, they want better outcomes for their patients. All providers want that. But, you know, it's not always made easy in the regulation, right, to get from A to B. But um, anyway, Donnelly, please, you'd like to add something. Yeah, definitely. I just wanted us to um, go back to the conversation about severe maternal morbidity um, because it is so important. And um, when we, we talk about a multi-pronged approach, which is, of course, what we need when we're talking about a complex problem, of course, it involves obstetricians. Of course, it involves uh, those of us who are in women's health. But uh, one of the pieces of legislation uh, talked about hospital ERs um, asking persons of childbearing age about the history, uh, about their specific pregnancy related, um, you know, the recent pregnancy history, which is hugely important because many times we see certain symptoms as pregnancy related or not pregnancy related, but we know that women who are postpartum can have chest pain, can have shortness of breath, which people may not necessarily think of as being pregnancy related, but these are life-threatening symptoms that need to be addressed right away. So it's, it's our OB providers, but it's also our ER colleagues. It's also our internal medicine colleagues. It's going to take all of us working together um, to recognize and look at the best practices and implement in these, um, these practices. And just when we talk about mortality, of, co of course, the loss of any woman is one loss too many. But those women who suffer severe maternal mor morbidity are living with that trauma for a lifetime. And so that, so we, we and, and, it, and it carries with them. Right, I, I'm thinking about the impact of traumas on health in general, whether you're a child or an adult. I mean, that's a whole nother, you know, in series of, of issues that, that compound. Um, yeah, I, Leslie, I'd like to, I, I was thinking as we're talking about that, I was trying to, I was, in my mind, turning over why is it that um, that these these clinical issues related to pregnancy aren't known to other providers? And I'm thinking in my mind, is this just because women's health has traditionally been siloed in one area? And it's you know, it's again, we go back to the sexism and the racism. I, I don't mean to pile the big meaty question on you, but tell us a little bit about that intersection and why that sexism and racism and why, how this comes out in women's health and, and you know, what we're seeing or, or reproductive health, I should say. Sure. I mean, I'll leave it to my clinical colleagues if they want to dig in a little more on medical school curricula and training, but to put it even more broadly, I mean, as a culture, we are terrible at talking about sex and sexuality. So right. it is not that surprising that then we fail all the way through uh, and you know we don't 
have the conversations and the listening doesn't happen. Um, and I think another really big missed signal has been really talking to women. You know, it was interesting when I was writing one of my early grants on this, you can look and there's tons of what's called quantitative work, tons of looking at the numbers and what's gone on. And there was almost nothing qualitative almost nothing talking to women about their experience all the way through, all the way through the healthcare system. Did they come back to the ER and were they sent home because they said, oh yeah, you just feel terrible, you just had a baby. So I'm really pleased that part of what I'm um, getting the opportunity to do is a true what's called community-based participatory research, where I'm going to be able to recruit and pay eight to 10 black women from Newark who experience severe maternal morbidity. They develop the research questions, talk to people, do the analysis, and then hopefully a year from now when we do this again, they are on the panel telling us what we could be doing in the healthcare system. Um, it's interesting, you know, some journalists have been real uh, heroes on this. There's a series called Lost Mothers by a woman named Nina Martin. And I got to hear her speak. And she talked about, though, that she tried to engage this issue of how racism showed up in women's experience. And women didn't necessarily tell her. And that's when I thought, well, we've got to get women to talk to other women who've had the same experience. And then we'll get to hear how this manifests. I, I was so struck about a year or so ago, there was an assembly hearing in which a lot of the legislation, um, I, I think some of it had just been introduced um, and it became a, a complete forum on birth, right? It was a panel of female legislators and they talked in the most profound and open ways about their different birth experiences. And there were white women on the panel who had had an amazing experience. And there were the, the, the black legislators who had had multiple um, cesareans, never offered a choice, you know, told you have a big child, it's gotta be a cesarean, no conversation with the doctor. I mean, it was completely anecdotal, you could say, but it was, you know, there were different women with different backgrounds and you know all mothers and it was just it was remarkable i thought um and it seemed like one of the things we have done well in new jersey is starting to elevate women's voices um i just throw it out to anybody i don't know who wants to start are we doing are we getting where we need to go with listening to women in this i know this is a thing listening to women Brittany, i'm going to come to you first Sure. Um, I agree. I think New Jersey has done a great, a great job at elevating the voices of women. I think we will always have room to grow in terms of elevating <laughs> the voices of, of women of color specifically. Um, I don't, I don't see a time in the near future where we're doing that nearly enough. Um, but I think that we've done a lot of really amazing work on um, the, the maternal mortality and maternal health outcomes. And, you know, the other day I had someone ask me if, if you were to, um, wave a magic wand and be able to see any change in reproductive health as a whole, you know, what would you see? And my answer was was simple, that I want to see the same excitement and investment and interest and commitment that we've seen across the state in maternal health be adopted in reproductive health as a whole. Um, we have such wonderful advocates and researchers and educators and healthcare providers that if we really expand to this full spectrum, um, we'll really see such a change. I think we have a lot of room to grow, but a lot of opportunity in New Jersey in this space. Um, so I think we can really elevate voices by not just looking at, you know, not just valuing women when they're giving birth or right after they've given birth, but valuing their entire healthcare experience throughout their, the full spectrum of care um, and looking at contraceptive care, um, sex education, like Leslie mentioned, that that would be really elevating women's health. So that's where I would, I would hope to see us go. And we've seen through our work in maternal health that we have the ability to do that really well. There's no reason for us to wait until we're at the bottom of multiple rankings and reproductive health outcomes the way we were with maternity care. Let's not wait till we get there. Let's start doing it. Let's start doing it now. Right. Domaly, is there anything um, I'm thinking as a provider, how, how can you, what's your role in elevating women's voices in that way? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I think it's, 
I personally, um, this is really personal to me um, and important to listen to women. And I think that, yes, we can say as providers that we really want to provide better care and the best care. Um, we can't do that unless we know what women want, unless we know what their goals are. Um, and that requires us to do a little listening. As providers, we have a lot of power. Um, and I think we have to yield some of that power and just learn to listen. And um, I would urge my colleagues, I, I feel like um, maybe some of us are individually doing it. Um, and every time I think I'm doing it, I try to be very introspective and think, let me do it a little bit more. Um, and each time I do that, I can learn a little bit more about what that woman's personal goals are, what her values are. And that's how we really get to the same place. Uh, these terms, shared decision making, they're not just terms. They are, we're, these are really about someone's life. And we can't get there unless. I, as a provider, really have an understanding um, of what the woman's goal is, uh, what her fears are. And for mm -hmm. the first time in my 20 years, I had a woman tell me this year, I don't want to die. Mm -hmm. I don't want to die. I want to make sure that you know that I want you to save my life. That was mm -hmm. like so piercing to me. Because, and all I could do is tell her, of course, I am going to do everything to save your life. But in 20 years, I never had a woman tell me, I want to make sure you know that I want you to do everything to save my life. Well, I, I'm struck by what, you know, what the first lady said at the start about, you know, it's 2020. I mean, the sense that women die in childbirth, something that has been, you know, occurring, people say, naturally for ever. I mean, it's just, it's a little overwhelming to me. I mean, I, I'm not a mother, but I know it, it can be a very traumatic and chaotic process, right? It's a big deal, but it, it seems like it has to come like that. Yeah. Um, I'd like to do one sort of, oh, sorry. Let's continue this. This is good. Linda, let me start with you and then I'll come to Leslie, okay? Okay, just very quickly. Thank you, um, Domly, for that really insightful, those insightful statements. And, you know, as midwives, our, our motto is kind of listen to women. So we really try to do that. But as all providers, um, we need to understand. And, and I think the piece of that shared decision making is honoring the desires of the person and understanding that people are experts in their own lives, right? We need to understand that they really know their lives better than we know their lives. And that's the sharing. We need to get that information from people so they can share information appropriately according to their needs and really honor that understanding that they're experts in their own lives. Yeah, Leslie, I'm sorry, go ahead. What yeah, like no, that? I mean, I was going to just throw in that, you know, the United States is the only developed country where maternal mortality is going up. Um, I had an opportunity to go speak on this in Tanzania, and they just, they couldn't believe it. They couldn't understand when we have, you know, we're not lacking a place to do a cesarean. We're not lacking the drugs. So we know that it is these other kinds of elements. But I think to what everybody's lifting up about listening. When we think about system and structures, listening takes time. And yeah. so we really do need to look within the systems and look at how the administrative policies, the insurance policies, they all pull people toward going as quickly as possible. And we know all of us, even when we're not clinicians, when we go as quickly as possible, we miss things. So um, this is another connecting the dots moment that I think we're not gonna train our way out of this. We have to have systems and structures that encourage people, especially in times of stress, to do the things they need to do 
to, I mean, I think this is probably not just about women's health care, but all health care. You reduce mistakes when people have all kinds of cues to slow down, when systems are in place, when there are multiple eyes upon things. So I think we can get a little more sophisticated than, uh, you know, another online training that people need to do at their lunch hour. Yeah, I mean, it seems as though, you know, we're talking about these sort of monumental health issues. And like you said, it's not just that we have the capacity to do a cesarean, we, we have clean water, we have all the basic things that a lot of other countries don't. And yet, you know, this is still a challenge. So, um, but that was a hopeful way to sort of leave it. I'm going to leave it there. Um, I'd like to thank my panelists for this great, uh, wonderful conversation and for sticking with us through the technology technological challenges. Um, and I'm going to pitch it back to Steve for to close. Thank you. Thanks, Lilo. And thanks to our wonderful panel for such wonderful insight. It was powerful. We're talking about, one second, waiting for my intro. Um, it's not clear whether I'm live, live right now, so I'm going to speak. You are this live. This is a powerful conversation. <laughs> okay, okay. We're talking about people's lives. Thanks so much to our esteemed panelists. This has been extremely worthwhile, a conversation to be completed. would like to thank also First Lady Tammy Murphy for her wonderful address and our sponsors, New Jersey Healthcare Quality Institute, Nicholson Foundation, Planned Parent Parenthood Action Fund of New Jersey, and Thrive NJ for helping make this possible. I would just like to say to everyone, on behalf of NJ Spotlight News, thank you, and look for an email from us with the full video of this presentation within the next day or two, and we will publish this on NJ Spotlight News as well. Thank you again for being with us, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. <laughs>